Hi, my name is Jack Watson, and I teach visual art and art history at Durham School of the Arts in Durham, North Carolina. I teach high school classes, so it's uh, 2D visual arts uh, all the way from beginning up to AP, as well as AP art history. I think this past year uh, has shown us that the importance of social-emotional learning uh, for students uh, has been thrown into high relief as a result of the pandemic. And uh, so we, we all have a, have a duty to, uh, to be aware of how to work social emotional learning uh, skills into our curriculum. As art teachers, we have an, an opportunity to, uh, to explore this in the classroom. You know, we have students who are discovering uh, and exploring and learning, uh, but very often school art becomes about assignment completion. It becomes about technical problems. And uh, you know, what we need to do is uh, enable students to take some control and some, some agency in their own uh, learning experience. So what is agency and what does it look like in the art classroom? You know, uh, often it's about uh, voice and choice and uh, you know, having some means of expressing oneself and choosing what to express. It's about uh, taking action, it's about having control, and it's ultimately about having power and it's having uh, control over one's own learning experience. And when you talk to teachers about giving students more control, it often makes them nervous. Uh, but I found that when students have control and they feel like they genuinely have some uh, power within the classroom, that they don't want to mess it up, um, that they feel a sense of ownership of it. Um, so one of the ways that I instill that is uh, you know, giving students um, a way into everything, whether it's a technique or a concept that we're dealing with. So we usually start with some experimentation uh, with a medium or a technique uh, so they can get a sense of what it does for them. Uh, there's also for uh, dealing with the concepts, you know, we make personal connections uh, to whatever that concept may be, um, so they feel like it's relevant to them. Um, we do some collaborative planning and learning uh, so that students can work with each other and uh, kind of sort out some, you know, with peers uh, how they fit into a particular idea. Um, and then there's also many opportunities for reflection, evaluation, and uh, you know, reconsidering directions. Next, what I'll do is share a couple examples of how I you know, develop this sense of agency in the classroom. One of the experiences I'll be talking about is a project uh, that's really more than just a project. It's a, a whole unit. Um, called Five Artists Who, and it begins as a research project but ends in, a, in an art making project. But I don't use the word research because that usually turns students off, but uh, the way that I get them to it is it starts with looking. We start by looking at arts um, and we look at a, a wide variety of art and then students identify something that they're interested in, in that art. And it could be something about the, uh, the identity of the artist, or it could be something about the way a piece is made. Uh, and then they go from there to uh, discovery and sort of um, finding uh, more artists uh, and kind of exploring uh, beyond just that first artist and find other artists who share that same quality that they identified in the first one. And then from there, they imagine themselves in that same group of artists and uh, think about what would their work look like if they could you know, exhibit with these artists they're discovering. And they go from there to making the artwork uh, that goes with it. Um, and then they're, you know, they're collaborating with other students who have similar goals. Uh, and then at the end, they're you know, uh, analyzing and reflecting about it and um, imagining you know, what the next piece might be. So it's sort of uh, similar to the design process cycle of, of making uh, and innovating and reflecting uh, but in an art studio context. With Five Artists 2, I usually start with a challenge, uh, which is to name five artists, which is uh, you know, it's something most students can do. Uh, but you know, we, we add more uh, to the question, uh, such as, like, can you name five artists who are uh, working today? You know, and then the hands start to go down. Can you name five artists working today who are uh, female or female identifying and the hands go down? Um, can you name uh, five uh, female contemporary artists of color working today? Um, and by that point, there's you know, very few hands up in the room. And so we have to have this conversation about uh, where are the gaps in, in your education? And uh, you know, why aren't we seeing more artists representative of, of who we are uh, in the classroom? And so students then uh, choose a theme uh, or a topic that is of interest to them. And it could be uh, you know, something to do with identity and representation, and maybe they want to see more artists like themselves. 
It could be something uh, more technical, like it could have to do with uh, you know artists who use digital media, or artists who uh, you know are um, you know using traditional oil pain painting techniques, or it could be something uh, more you know process oriented, like artists who make site-specific sculpture, or artists who uh, make scenes in public places, or things like that. Students will then choose the topic uh, that they feel a connection to. So at this point, you know, where they're going is a path that they've laid out for themselves. So we go from there into uh, you know, thinking about, all right, well, you know, what are the qualities in these artists? What are some things they all share? And I have them identify three different qualities. And again, it could be um, something to do with content or something to do with form or something to do with process or technique. Uh, and then they use those three criteria to guide the artwork that they make. So they're still making the artwork that they would make as an artist themselves, uh, but it's guided by these uh, three qualities that they've already identified in artwork that they like uh, or want to see more of. Um, and then at the end, those three criteria become criteria for assessment. Um, so they've uh, basically written their own rubric. Um, so they have their own goals. Uh, so rather than give them some teacher-made rubric uh, that may be arbitrary or have generic content, um, they are uh, going to be assessed on the things that actually matter to them and matters to the art that they're making. In that self-assessment, they'll do some reflection about what was successful and what wasn't successful and how it could be improved, and then start the cycle over again. Now, there are times when students have trouble getting started with something like this because uh, they are in the driver's seat you know, at, at every point. So, uh, you know, if a student doesn't feel a particular connection to a theme, they'll never get out of the, the first step. So uh, one thing that helps is having a sense of community in the classroom and, and uh, through peer support, students can, uh, can generate ideas based on the examples of what's around them. When they see students who are, uh, for example, um, picking a, a very specific uh, you know, uh, artistic theme because it's something they identify with. Uh, for example, I have a student who just turned in a project that was uh, non-binary Asian digital illustrators. And uh, this student was very excited about this topic and, and presented a wealth of information. And so when students uh, see what other students are doing, that gives them a sense of, oh, uh, well, so I can like, find my own way into this you know, through uh, something that I can connect with. Um, and so in, in an in-person setting, we can group students according to a particular topic or theme and um, help them through that, that process. Uh, once that sense of community is established in the classroom, that opens up so many uh, opportunities for art making in new ways. For example, what if you take this challenge of having all of these students who have kind of identified their artistic voice and put them together in groups uh, to form collectives, uh, then what can happen there? Uh, I once did a project that was called Fake Art Movements, and the idea was to, uh, to create a fake art movement and write a manifesto and make the art that would go with that. Um, and when I did that, the first time, uh, I had students who were working together and they said, uh, wait, Mr. Watson, can't we just do a real art movement? Uh, and I said, well, sure. Um, so they sequestered themselves away uh, in a small supply closet that I had, uh, and uh, I gave them permission to transform the space however they wanted to. And uh, each artist contributed something to this installation in this room. Uh, and they called themselves the Frog Project, and I'm not exactly sure, I still don't remember why they called themselves that, uh, but um, each student made a piece that went into this uh, installation, and they had an opening for the installation and invited you know, all the other classes up. Um, and it was uh, some of the most inventive uh, work that I've seen from students. I had no part in it. Um, all I did was give them the space and the permission. Uh, but, you know, these, the artwork that they were making was very much their own um, it, and it was a surprise to me and, uh, and a delight uh, and it, it's, um, you know, it shows the possibility of what happens when giving students control. Once you've established that sense of community and agency in the classroom, uh, there's, uh, you know, so many opportunities to take it beyond the classroom. Uh, into the community at large. Um, and one thing that I do outside of uh, the regular confines of school is uh, an extracurricular club. It's not really a club so much as a collective called Art in Action. And this is a student-led collective working at the intersection of art and activism. And I put a call out you know, to students all across the school. Uh, they don't just have to be artists. They can be uh, musicians or, or, 
or non-artists, um, and I, I invite them to come uh, to my classroom and we have a conversation about the issues that matter to them. Um, and then, you know, I turn over the space, my art studio, uh, to them, uh, you know, one day a week, and they come in and do, uh, you know, about 30 minutes of talking and about 30 minutes of planning and making. Uh, and they uh, make artworks and experiences and interventions into the things that matter to them, um, taking action in their lives. So, for example, uh, we have an annual Dia de los Muertos festival, and uh, there's a, an altar making, an altar procession that goes with that. And uh, we were commissioned uh, by the student group that runs the, the arts festival to do a Say Their Names altar um, to recognize victims of, uh, of police brutality. And um, that became a, a center point in that, um, in that procession. And we also did an action for the uh, student walkout that happened around the uh, Parkland shootings. Uh, this was a student organized walkout. Uh, these similar walkouts happened nationally, but um, the Art in Action group worked with two other student groups to organize the walkout. And so while every student was outside of the classroom on that day, we handed out cards that were made by students that had a blank uh, inside. And so uh, students would write a response uh, or their ideas that they wanted to share about gun violence or gun legislation. And then we collected all of those cards and sent them to uh, state senators. And so the students organized uh, the distribution and collecting and, and mailing of those cards. Uh, and these are some of the examples of things that students have done um, you know, beyond the classroom. When talking with students about uh, their own school experience, they'll often express a frustration about um, not having a voice or feeling like a lack of, of voice and also a lack of control. And I think as art educators, we're, we're very good at giving them a, uh, a place to express themselves and giving them a voice. Uh, or encouraging them to find it. Um, and I think something that, that we as educators in general can improve upon is, is, uh, is giving them a sense of control as well. Uh, but this doesn't mean simply, you know, turning over the keys to the classroom to the students. Uh, there's uh, more to it. It's about creating an environment in which they can be successful, in which they can thrive. And that's an environment that requires, uh, it requires trust. It requires, um, you know, some intention on the part of the educator to set it up with with a structure, you know, that in which those students can be successful. Uh, but uh, in doing so, it'll create a situation in which students can support each other and um, and to feel uh, a sense of empowerment. <laughs>